Welcome back to today's episode of Resilient Health Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Darren Ingalls, and my guest today is Dr. Anna Maria Temple. She is an integrated pediatrician, author, mother, blogger, and expert on eczema. So today we're going to talk about eczema, and I want to mention your three books just because they're so cool. So you wrote the book called The Rule of Five, A Parent's Guide to Raising Healthy Kids in an Unhealthy World. Amazing. Then you wrote Healthy Kids in an Unhealthy World, Practical Parenting Tips for Picky Eating, Toxin Reduction, and Stronger Immune Systems. And your latest book, I know that just came out like a month ago, is Ending the Eczema Epidemic, Surprising Solutions to Transform Your Child's Skin from Within. So I really want to talk about that today. So That's Dr. awesome. Tim. And I want to tell you, so the, the rule of five, yeah. that was our first book. And everyone was, uh, well, the business gurus were like, what is this title? The rule of five. That's a horrible. I was like, oh, I'm going to go cry <laughs> in the corner. So we actually just redid it there. And I just call it healthy kids and not healthy world. So um, anyway, just to let people know, when you know, a lot of times you see stuff like it's put out there like, oh, it's amazing. It's so easy. No, no, it's not easy. Uh, we got majorly criticized by the business team and had to like redo a whole so many different things because apparently our title was horrible. <laughs> well, you know, at the end of the day, the content is what matters. And what I really appreciate about you is that, again, you take this very holistic, integrative approach to kids' health and that it's about, you know, treating the whole person, looking at gut health and diet and toxicity and all things, you know, we talk about in terms of creating resilience. But today I really want to do a deep dive into eczema. This is such a common problem. I see a lot of kids in my practice. And it's just that ongoing nagging thing that makes kids crazy. It makes parents crazy. So, you know, what are some of maybe some of the biggest misconceptions people have about eczema? Oh, gosh, I love talking about it. So the, probably the biggest misconception is that it's just a skin issue. Just like you alluded yeah. to that when we talk about an organ system in the traditional model, we have been taught to just focus on the one organ. So when it comes to eczema, we go to the dermatologist who focuses on the skin or we go to the at traditional allergist focuses on the skin or the pediatrician and they focus on the skin. The parents focus on the skin because you're seeing red, hot, lava, bleeding, itchy skin. And what the traditional teaching is, put steroids on it. And when you put steroids on eczema, it gets better. We're not here to argue that. The problem is it doesn't cure it. It doesn't heal it. It doesn't actually treat it. It's just a band-aid solution for a symptom. And skin is not an organ that just lives out there without, you know, in a jar on a shelf, without the lungs, without the brain, without the teeth, it, leaves, it lives with all of that. So the, if the skin's affected, as you all well know, obviously dealing with your folks is we have allergies and we have asthma and we may have ADHD, we have anxiety, constipation, cavities, you know, it's a whole system approach. And so if we're dealing, we're saying that the skin is an issue from within, when we're just applying topical steroids or the latest, greatest lotion cream, we're not actually dealing with a zinc deficiency. Because if your child has a zinc deficiency and that's why they have eczema, you put all the topical fancy cream on top, that's not going to heal a zinc deficiency. If right. your child's microbiome is, just, is messed up because of antibiotics they've had or anti-reflux medicine they had or Tylenol, well, a topical steroid cream it's not going to fix the damage caused by antibiotics, Tylenol, or anti-reflux medications. So I would say the biggest misconception is that eczema is a lotion deficiency and parents <laughs> will spend $4,000 a year in search of the right cream or topical lotion for their children. And then they're frustrated, angry, and they feel let down. Well, that's such a great point to recognize that, again, it isn't just a superficial problem. And I, like I said, you know, it gets to be expensive. And, and again, I've seen people, you know, they put the steroids on, they get some temporary relief. And within a matter of days you know, of stopping the steroids, you know, the flare comes right back. They're back to itching and scratching and cracking and bleeding. So, again, looking deeper within. And, I mean, we see this for all the skin conditions, too. I mean, whether it's, you know, eczema, psoriasis other types of dermatitis or skin reactions, you know, more often than not, there's some internal thing that's provoking the skin. You know, I, I want to ask you as well, you know, in chapter three of your new book, you talk a lot about the role of genetics. Can you speak a little bit about how important are genetics in eczema? And is it really that simple that mom and dad had a disposition, therefore the kid's going to get it? 
Yeah, well, you know, that's probably like the second biggest misconception is like, you know, it's, <laughs> it's genetic. Therefore, there's nothing we can do. It's probably my favorite, one of my favorite things to hear and yours too. It's like, well, you know, we all had eczema. We all had asthma. So, I mean, nothing we can do. This we're all hoes. That's it. Cards where we're dealt. And so, <laughs> you know, um, genetics is, of course, we can't ignore genetics. So if a baron has eczema, the child is at 40% risk of getting eczema. If the two parents have eczema, it increases the child's risk of eczema by 60%. But what we're not hearing, it's 100%. So if it was all genetics, then if you have eczema, then your children are 100% at risk for having eczema. But it's not like that. Yes, it increases the risk. We have the power to change that risk. And again, you know, people that have the genetic, because some of the genes are, for example, filaggrin. So there you have um, filaggrin is like a scaffolding of a cell of the skin. And some people have a defect. So they're not making the strongest scaffolding. Right. But when you look at the genetics, only a few people that have that genetic uh, um, problem are going to have an issue with eczema. It's not 100% of people that have a filaggrin issue that are going to have that problem. And the same thing goes through the, there's so many different genetic issues that are with eczema. But when we look at who gets it, not 100% of the people, only a minority of people that have that genetic predisposition actually manifest it into eczema. So the way I tell people, I was like, well, genetics load the gun. They make our body more sensitive. And our environment and our diet pulls the trigger. And this is a very traditional teaching in functional medicine. Right. And then it is, so it's, is it fair that your child has to be on a specific diet? Is it fair that your child has to be on a supplementation? Is it fair that, you know, your child had to suffer? It's not fair at all. And, but genetics are not the answer. There's other things that have happened in our life in the course of what's going on to lead to eczema. A lot of times I tell people, I'm like, well, you know, you have the genetics, but during pregnancy, did we eat a lot of processed foods? Did we have a lot of stress? Did we have antibiotics? When the delivery, did we have, did the baby come out via a C-section, which means antibiotics? Did it come out vaginal delivery or vaginal delivery with burpee strep, which is more antibiotics? When you're nursing the babies, did you eat a lot of sugar, processed foods? You know, what was your stress level like? Was the baby pooping? Would the baby have reflux and the baby take time off? So you have the genetics as one of the many factors in the inflammatory bucket that all of us in functional medicine like to talk about. And then all the other things add up until the bucket spills over. But it's not just genetics on its own. It's a whole slew of things that way we look at humans in a chronic condition, right? Like a giant puzzle. And genetics is one piece. And then diet is a piece. Zinc is a piece. Omegas are a piece. Vitamin D is a piece. And so then, you know, our job as medical providers is to figure out how the puzzle comes together and where are the missing pieces. As I said, genetics just being only one of the many pieces. You know, we talk so much in functional medicine about leaky gut, and we now know you can have leaky brain and things like MS and other neurological conditions are a leaky brain. You know, is eczema to a certain degree leaky skin? I, you know, I do, I agree. It, it is leaky skin because when you have the scratchy, itching situation, you're, uh, you know, you're clawing your skin or maybe you have like really dry, brittle, cracked open skin, but that's leaky skin that's open instead of being, and I'm doing, I know we're on our podcast and I'm like literally trying to show you with my hands <laughs> what skin looks like. But it's, um, if you think of a brick and mortar, that's what the skin's supposed to look like. And in eczema, the bricks are not plopped. They're like crumbly. And the mortar is not this like a uh, nice, greasy, sticky substance. It's just crumbly and dry. So there's cracks between the bricks and there's cracks in the mortar. And then the body's exposed to the pollen, is exposed to the dog, the, the dust mites, the almonds you're eating, the tomatoes. And the body is, it, it comes inside, right? Because our skin is not like a, a piece of cellophane or a piece of tape. It's right. a living, breathing organism. And when it's cracked, the, the things we just mentioned go into the body and now the body can become more sensitive. And lo and behold, now I have a dog allergy, pollen allergy, almond allergy, or dust mite intolerance. You know, it's really interesting because I know in animal studies, if they want to do research on allergies, the way they sensitize, you know, the rat or the mouse is they scratch the skin. They break the skin open and that's how they introduce the antigen. So I can imagine if you've got a child who's got eczema, Again, potentially there's this disposition towards having more allergies, you know, ambi and or asthma because that open skin, and although you might see the open skin eczematous lesions, 
you know, there may be other parts of the skin that aren't as obvious, but, you know, if it has that sort of leaky texture, like you just described, you know, as they make contact with different things, it's possible that that becomes a sensitizing event towards other types of allergies. Right. And then you start thinking about, right, the lotions, the soaps, the detergents, makeup, a cleaning solutions, what you wash your floors with, what you wash your bed sheets with, what kind of carpet you have in your house. Right? Because now we're a lot of, I hear in the traditional model, when I talk about it, I'm like, oh, we got to be careful of the ingredients in all our products. They're like, you're ridiculous. It's just a tiny bit. And, you know, in your shampoo and a tiny little salad and a little tiny paraben, a tiny little fragrance. And I was like, right, but the average human puts like 120 chemicals on their body on a regular basis. So if those things are actually leaking through the skin, now we're causing uh, even more irritation to the immune system because we know that eczema is an out of control immune system. And I tell people, I'm like, you know, because it's not cellophane wrap our skin and it's a living, breathing organism, it has dendrites, which are these little like uh, amoeba looking things that have like little hands that come out through the skin and they feel what's on top of the skin. And once they feel that there's like too many parabens, stalates, fragrance, staph aureus, dog dander, it sends a signal to the immune system and it says like, rev up boys, we're under attack. And then the immune system is like, Wah. and then you got the itchy skin with hives and redness. And you're like, where did that come from? Because it is, it's coming from the outside within. You know, in, in chapter five of your new book, you talk a lot about <clears throat> dairy. You know, I think dairy and gluten, of course, we always talk about the two big guys of causing every health issue, right? <laughs> uh, and of course, you know, there's a lot of foods out there that are mucus forming foods, you know, dairy, bananas, oranges, you know, whether you're allergic to them or not, you get kind of that snotty, phlegmy stuff. But you also talk about the role of sugar. And again, I think this maybe gets uh, skirted over a little bit. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what role is sugar uh, and sweetener uh, playing with eczema? Well, you know, I, d I think our people that listen to us, they do know about dairy and gluten and they're like, my God, can you talk against our last pop thing out? You know, <laughs> and it's, but I do think, and what I find in my family is that sugar, it, it's funny because it's not addressed by a lot of actually even holistic practitioners. They go right to dairy. And I was like, well, we can't skip processed foods and we can't skip sugar. Sugar has infiltrated all of our children's diets. If you look, go to the store and if the package says kids, that to me is an automatic signal. There's sugar in here. And I 99% of the time I flip that package over and there's sh added sugar within the package. And we don't even realize that sugar not only increases insulin, and when you increase insulin, that actually increases growth factors and irritates the, the immune system. But sugar actually goes through the skin and cause glycolic, glycosylation, big word, um, which means that the sugar attaches to the infrastructure of the cells, creating brittle structures, which we see in wrinkles, which we see in acne, and we see eczema and psoriasis. So the sugar actually deposits in our skin cells and causes a brittleness that leads to eczema. And then sugar also is in our microbiome and leads to yeast overgrowth. And then if you have had antibiotics in your past, like you know, you and I have always talked about, is that once you take one round of antibiotics, it actually can kill up to a third of your microbiome. But what, there's not an empty hole left in your microbiome. It, that hole gets filled by either unsavory bacteria or yeast. And if you or your child are eating a high sugar diet, well, we're feeding the yeast and the yeast is like awesome. And so now we fertilize yeast. The yeast sends messages to the taste buds and to the brain saying, please eat more sugar. Please eat more simple carbs. And then we eat more simple carbs and sugars. And then we yell at our children that they don't have any self-control when in fact they can't even control themselves because they're being controlled by yeast in their gut. And the more you eat sugar, the happier the yeast is, the stronger the signal to the taste buds in the brain. And now that we become sugar addicts and with more sugar comes more yeast. And when we have more yeast, then that actually causes more eczema issues, flares, redness, itching, scratching, because yeast upsets the immune system and sends the immune system into overdrive. Uh, I think it's important to point out when we talk about sugar, you know, we're not even really talking about cane sugar because it's hardly in anything anymore. You know, we stopped importing and we don't even grow sugar in the United States. They didn't grow it in Hawaii anymore. So we have to import it from Asia. It's a lot expensive. So corn syrup, 
became a very inexpensive replacement. And like you're talking about, you look at any packaged food these days, there's some element of corn syrup. And, and, and corn syrup makes me crazy because they hide it. And they called a bunch of different names. So if you had no idea that dextrin and maltodextrin and fructose and molotol and xylitol and most of these things that you probably can't even pronounce may be some hybrid of corn syrup. And what makes it even worse is that corn syrup is sweeter than sugar, actual cane sugar, and it's highly addictive. I think I've read studies that equate it to being, you know, as addictive as cocaine. So there's no mystery to why food manufacturers are putting this in your kids' foods because they want to create a little sugar addict. Well, right, because, you know, people are like, oh, they don't, it can't be that bad. I'm like, no, they hire food scientists because they want you to think when you finish the package of the food, of the Little Bites muffin things, you, they want the consumer to think about the next package that they're going to buy. So the whole point is like, how addictive can we get this food so the people are going to continue buying more of this? They're not looking at your children's health. They have no interest in it whatsoever. And they, that's, it's propagating the issue. And I love that you brought up the, the corn syrup. Here's another sneaky place where a lot of people don't even realize it's in there. Baby formula. Yes. It is the first ingredient and shame on us, corn syrup solids. And you know, when I looked on said formulas website, they go corn syrup solid, not a sugar. And I'm like, what? <laughs> it's just, I think they missed something in chemistry. <laughs> it's horrible. And you know, on a formula, so the FDA as of 2021 required food companies to put added sugar on the label so people can identify added sugar easier, except formula companies. There's nowhere on a formula bottle oh. that is by the traditional, I'm not talking about my other people, but the traditional that has sugar. Like it's almost like, oh yeah, there's no sugar in here. I'm like, well, not only is it corn syrup solids, but then there's rice syrup. So there's, I know for a fact, there's a lot of sugar in these, but yes, the number one ingredient in, especially the non, the broken down formulas, corn syrup solids. And it drives me nuts because we're creating sugar addicts from infancy. And then we're like, well, how did my toddler get so picky? I'm like, well, it started when they were, and you didn't know because sometimes boobs don't work. Sometimes nursing doesn't work. Sometimes you don't want a nurse. It, there's no shame. The shame is on the, the formula companies that have created products and blinded us to what is actually in the formulas. And since eczema starts between three and six months of age, most commonly, formula is something we really need to address and talk about and think about as, of course, as a maternal diet. But, you know, I just find that oftentimes people are blown away when I'm like, corn syrup solids and your formula is sugar. They're like, well, and what I think along the formula line that, that is insane to me is that if you have a child that is really having problems with traditional formula, which tend to be dairy or soy based, they switch them to Neocade, which is like 40% corn syrup. And I'm like, okay, we went from one horrible thing to something that's even worse. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know what the solution is to that, but it is shocking that you know, from the very early in life, so many of these kids who are dependent on formula for their nutrition, it's just, it's so hard to find good, clean formula, particularly in the United States. Yeah. And so I, will, I know that probably the next question for um, families listening to this is going to be like, well, my gosh, well, what do we do? So I'm going to, is it right with you? I'll just give the, you know, the one formula that I use is actually HIP, H-I-P-P, hypoallergenic combiotic. It's a formula from Germany. It's a broken down formula, good ingredients, third party tested, no heavy metals in it, organic. Um, and what they do is actually they take lactose and break it apart into tiny, tiny smithereens. So a popular misconception, you'll see lactose on there. And I'm like, well, it's dairy, therefore I can't use it. Well, the issue with dairy is that it's a whole, uh, so when, back to what you were talking about with leaky gut, when you have leaky gut, big chunks of milk, dairy, go through in the intestinal wall. And when the body sees a giant chunk of dairy, it's like, I don't know what that is. So I'm going to be sensitive to it because it's annoying me because the body knows calcium, magnesium, fat, proteins, amino acids. So in leaky gut, chunks of whole milk are going through. In the hypoallergenic formulas where they use a mechanism to break the milk apart, it's in tiny, tiny, tiny little uh, pieces, if you will, and the antibodies for dairy do not recognize the tiny pieces. They're looking for big chunks of dairy. 
So that's how the hypoallergenic formula can be from lactose without causing a dairy issue. So I don't want to confuse the issue, but I know when you pick up the package, you're going to go, wait, what? So I wanted to explain that it's specifically manufactured. So children with lacto, with dairy issues and soy issues can tolerate this actually beautifully. Does it work in 100% of the people? No, but it works in a lot majority of the people. And so it is my go-to broken down formula. Great. Well, that's great, Tiff, because again, I know I've always struggled with giving good recommendations on clean formula because, you know, I've seen some of the ones that are available in the United States and inevitably, again, there's something in it that you're kind of like, oh, you know, yeah. I, I kind of feel bad about recommending yeah. it. But you know, so, got- so uh, well, I'll tell you, Baby Only Organics is made in the U.S. and they have a plan based formula that I uh, they just came out with it. I've talked to the CEO and the nutritionist and their formula is says toddler on it because you have to have clinical research trials in babies to market it for babies, but it is the formulation is for babies. So I will use that when my family's request a US based, there's a, again, baby only organics, uh, plant-based formula that you can use. It's a pea based formula. And then there's also else nutrition that is a nut based. Talk to that company as well. They're from Israel. And they, um, they've also trying to help the market where children can, that cannot tolerate dairy or soy can have partake in formulas as well. Great. That's a great tip. Um, you know, I think so many people, when they think about eczema, you know, definitely there's an association with food. I know my own practice, I test and treat a lot of kids for food sensitivities. In many cases, that helps clear up the eczema. But it's more than just food, right? So, you know, what should other what are other things that parents should be thinking about beyond the food sensitivities, again, that can be triggers for eczema? Yeah, and you know, I love that you do the same thing in, in your practice and working on nutrition. Nutrition is the cornerstone of healing, but sometimes we get, and it's not that we're focused on nutrition, we're focused on food elimination, which can be really dangerous and can really cause a problem. That's why I always like, you don't do food elimination, you do food replacement. If you take out dairy, you have to replace it with an equally good fat source and mineral source. Um, You can't just be like, I'm not going to eat because the more you eliminate, and sometimes people end up on less. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not good either. And we become so hyper-focused on food. So they're like, I've removed gluten and dairy. I'm better, yay. And I'm like, okay, what else have we done? Because if you just remove the food, and you don't heal the gut or replenish the micronutrients, which we're about to talk about in a second. The plan is then we're never going to eat gluten and dairy. That's a horrible plan. Like we don't put, right? Our children, we don't say never have that. We want to try to get in a balance at the end of our programs. We're like, at the end, you're able to have a little this, a little that. No, I don't want you to eat dairy every day and gluten every day, but you should be able to tolerate it in small amounts without any problem. And the issue is that we focus on the food elimination, which needs to be replacement. Then We also need to be mindful that there's micronutrient deficiency. I mean, zinc is a huge one, vitamin D, magnesium, B12, B6, vitamin C. And a lot of folks are like, yeah, but I eat a whole foods diet and I'm getting my plants from a farm. I'm like, I love it. But is the farm remineralizing the soil? Because if you don't rotate the crops, if you don't, and I'm not a farmer, I'm just saying from what I've learned from how minerals get into food, because a nut that's supposed to have a lot of zinc can't have zinc unless it's in the soil. The, like the nut's not making the thing. The right. nut is absorbing it from the soil. And then when the chicken eats the grass, it reason there's zinc in meat is because it ate it from the grass that the grass got it from the soil. So it's a whole kind of system. And when you look at nuts and like whole foods, the FDA doesn't mandate that the food companies actually test the micronutrients inside the nut. So like when you get, let's say, um, I don't know, like pistachios for a second. You don't see the breakdown there. They'll go, oh, there's how much calcium and this, whatever. But no one's actually testing the nut that they're going right. by what generally pistachios should have versus like, well, what did the farmer put in the soil and does this food? So what we're seeing is a lot of people developing micronutrient deficiencies, even though they're eating amazing food because it's not coming from the food source. We already touched upon the microbiome inside for every one human cell. We are 10 bacteria cells. Fun fact for everyone, three to four pounds of our Adult body weight is actually bacteria weight. So all that bacteria, if it's not in balance, if we have too many of the bad, we have too much yeast, not enough of the good, will set off the cascade of eczema and immune system dysfunction. But the microbiome is not just in our gut, it's also in our skin. What are we doing on our skin to coddle, treat, and deal with the sensitive bacteria that live in our skin? And do we have a good balance 
because a lot of times we focus on the inside, but I'm like, okay, well, a little bit on the outside too. Then there's DOA deficiency, which is an enzyme in our digestive tract that needs to happen. We deal with histamine intolerance. I think histamine intolerance is overly used and people go on too many low histamine diets when in fact, it's just one or two histamine foods are the problem, not the whole cascade. Uh, obvious stress, right? We don't talk enough about stress. I mean, the amount of stress in our daily lives that transfers to the children. And, you know, on one of my master classes, somebody was like, children don't have any stress. And I had a NICU nurse jump in. She was like, I'm a neonatal nurse. I'm like, I can give you thousands of examples of how just NICU babies can suffer so much stress from, you know, the world that they were born into and the conditions. Not, she's like, not to mention as the kids grow up into what's going on in the world. Can we for a moment just focus on what's in the world right now when the rates of anxiety and stress in our children are higher than they've ever been before. And that's just a few things that we work on. Oh, and then of course, environmental toxins that we already discussed and alluded to earlier that all have to be taken into consideration aside from just food. Well, again, this is what I really appreciate your book and your work is that you're taking this very comprehensive approach to eczema. Again, it's not about slathering a bunch of goo on your skin. It's about looking at all these other underlying internal factors that really drive the problem. So the new book, folks, is The Ending the Eczema Epidemic. You definitely want to check it out. It's just a great resource, lots of great tips on managing eczema. And actually, I also want to mention that you were one of our several guests on uh, my upcoming Allergy and Asthma Summit that's coming out March 13th through 19th. You'll definitely want to tune into our talk because, again, we had a deeper discussion about eczema and you gave a lot of great tips, again, on managing that. So tune in. And if people want to connect with you, what's the best way for folks to find you? Well, the best way to uh, find me is generally shopping at Costco, Target, and Walmart. <laughs> That's where I show you the foods to buy because knowing and doing are two very different things. And I find a lot of like, just like the formula conversation that like, we know not to look for is like, okay, awesome. But then what should I buy? So anyway, I'm on Instagram at D-R-A-N-A Maria Temple. TikTok is Dr. Anna Maria. YouTube, the YouTube channel, all my channels are D-R-A-N-A Maria Temple. And where I can do various videos on shopping and holistic approaches to various issues, because if we don't treat the ear infections in a holistic method, the treatments for the ear infection will lead to asthma, eczema, allergies. If we don't treat constipation holistically from the whole body perspective, that will lead to those soul things since our whole body is interconnected. So try to give you guys all kinds of approaches from any different angles, depending on which social media platform you enjoy. Yeah, definitely. I enjoy your Instagram a lot. Again, I see just so many great tips. And I love the fact that we were talking earlier that involve your family, your son is often you know involved. Yeah. So it's a great, uh, fun, and again, a lot of great information. So definitely uh, check her out on Instagram. So again, Dr. Temple, I really appreciate you joining me on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me.